Thank you, Andre. It is uh, good to be home. Um, I do consider this uh, home. I tell you, it's, uh, it's always neat to come back and see the changes that have happened. Uh, certainly, uh, we lived here um, in the early 2000s um, to to late uh, to the late uh, to about I guess 2013. And uh, so there's been a lot of changes, and each time I get to work in the area, it's really, really fun to be here. Um, I want to just start by saying, uh, I, I want to applaud y'all for uh, the continuing to be community uh, during this pandemic. Um, that is something that I think is very challenging right now. And uh, I think too many of our communities have just decided to shut, shut all that down. Um, and so I, I applaud the chamber for taking the steps to be able to still have these kind of gatherings. Um, and uh, you honored uh, an ambassador today, and uh, I, I was greeted by an ambassador in the parking lot uh, today, someone who I hadn't seen in years, Pam Otica. Uh, she and her husband, Mike, uh, they run Lazy Creek uh, Pet Supply. And honestly, Pam, I can't think of a word that is less appropriate for you than lazy. Um, but uh, I'll just say, this would be inappropriate for her to do this, but I'll say if you have a pet, go buy some stuff. If you don't, go buy a pet and buy some stuff. Um, but these are great people. Pam and I worked together uh, many years ago, and it was wonderful to see her. Wonderful to see so many uh, folks that uh, I haven't connected with in a while. Uh, but it has been a real privilege uh, for me and, and my firm to be involved with the uh, Lower Saluda Greenway. And right now we're at a feasibility study stage, but what's exciting is to see, see the enthusiasm that's percolating um, and beginning to come, come from below the surface and, and up above. Um, and just seeing as many people here this morning interested in this topic, uh, this is what we've seen throughout the study process. And the entire study process has been conducted during the pandemic. And I will tell you that this is one of the most uh, community-involved events I have ever experienced in my 26 years of working in this industry. Um, and that really speaks volumes uh, to the excitement and enthusiasm behind this project. Um, I do want to certainly say that uh, my firm is privileged to work uh, for the Central Midlands Council of Governments and the Irmo Chapman Recreation Commission. They have partnered on this. I want to recognize Mark Smyers, who's here today from ICRC. Um, I haven't seen anybody from CMCOG here, but if you are here, thank you for being here. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to get into this. Um, I may, it may be a no-no to touch the mic, but uh, I, I get to leave and go back to Spartanburg. So you know, if that's a no-no, we're welcome. Um, but I need to, I want to make sure I'm seeing what you're seeing. So uh, just a little overview of what we're going to cover today, and we're, we're going to go through this at a pretty good clip, because I know we won't be out of here by 8.30. Um, I understand y'all have jobs, um, so we're going to we'll try to get you to those. Uh, but we're going to go through a few, uh, few aspects of the project. Um, first of all, the project approach, uh, just the project area, I think most people are familiar with this. Hopefully you can kind of make this map out from where you're sitting. The, the brighter green dotted lines are what we're really looking at. So it's two key segments. One that would connect uh, the Lake Murray Dam walkway down to the existing trails at Saluda Shoals, and then be on the, uh, on the eastern end of Saluda Shoals, connecting down uh, to the recently opened Saluda River Walk. Um, and I say recently opened with some quotes because uh, I know people have been on it for a long time, but it's been recently officially open. And that's the amazing thing about greenways. Uh, you just can't keep people off of them. So that's what we're looking at. Let's see, there we go. Our project approach, uh, this is a key graphic, and I would encourage you if you haven't, we've got two videos on YouTube, uh, really easy to find. You just go to YouTube and you uh, search for Lower Saluda Greenway. They should come up pretty, pretty near the top. Um, and this is a graphic from one of our videos. We did a kind of an intro video initially, and then we did a summary video uh, a few weeks back. We've had great responses on those. But essentially what a feasibility study is trying to do is not necessarily demonstrate that this project is needed, um, because uh, it's almost a no-brainer uh, that it's needed. Uh, but it's to demonstrate how can we accomplish the project, and what's the best way to accomplish the project. 
Um, and what partners do we need to put together to do that? So what you see here, uh, kind of this line here is the feasibility study process. What we've been doing is a lot of technical analyses. So we've looked at it from uh, a constructability standpoint. We've walked uh, the entire corridor. Uh, we've done some, uh, not a full wetlands delineation, but we have looked at wetlands and GPS and points. We've looked at all different environmental features and we've documented those. And then we look at the opportunities and constraints behind that. So what's gonna be the easier things to accomplish? What may be the more difficult things to accomplish? And even the difficult things, how do we get those done? And that gives us an understanding of the project. Um, I also wanna say that uh, there's a lot, uh, or there's a number of folks who said, why are we doing a study? We know where we wanna put this. We know that it needs to happen. Why a study? Well, what also this study accomplishes, and maybe one of the biggest things, is it will open the door for funding, uh, and particularly the ability to leverage federal funding. So uh, the federal government requires certain things to occur in a certain uh, manner and format, and so that's, that's why this study is being done. And then I do want to stress public engagement throughout, and then our hope, uh, obviously, is that, we'll move, that uh, the project will move into design and construction. So there's two key aspects. Uh, you want a purpose and you want a need uh, to your project. And again, this is part of uh, going through the federal process. And this is what we defined as our purpose. And I'll focus uh, on the red part there, uh, to increase safe access to nearby parks, trails, and destinations, aid in short trip multimodal travel, and increase regional connectivity and unity. Um, and those are things I think that ring really true uh, for Lexington County. Those are things that this county holds near and dear to their heart. So that's our purpose, and then also our need. You see here the community has made it abundantly clear that connected, safe, and comfortable non-motorized transportation and recreation facilities are of paramount importance. The current active transportation network lacks safe connectivity between communities. And if you recall the map I showed you previously, these are two critical connections. Because not only do they begin to connect Lexington County, but they connect Lexington County across the river to Richland County and the Three Rivers Greenway network. And so suddenly you have a very powerful network that not only benefits your community, but suddenly it's, a, it's an even bigger tourism attraction, it's a bigger regional attraction. Um, in fact, just locally, we estimate that this will benefit over 56,000 people immediately, just in immediate vicinity. Uh, but when you begin to think about that more regionally, uh, Greenway networks like this, Three Rivers Greenway is already seeing it, but they, these are places, these are destinations. These are places that people put the bikes on the back of the car and they go to these types of places. So this, this will be huge. Uh, public engagement, I do want to give you a rundown of what we've done there. Um, so I'm not going to give you quite the math, math lesson that Mike did. I, I put all the numbers on the board and I did the math for you. But I want you to focus on that bottom line. Basically 3,000, and if I add the 75 of you into that number, I've got my 3,000. 3,000 people, 3,000 interactions over the course of this project. And again, I want to stress that that's all been during the pandemic, okay? So what, what this has taught me is that some of the ways we used to do public outreach may not be that great. Because if we didn't have a pandemic, I would have had some public meetings. And at public meetings, I would have probably gotten 40, 50 people, maybe. This informational video served as my first public meeting for this project. And the interesting thing about that is I do want to stress that we already had scoped that to be a video uh, prior to the pandemic. But this final summary video was going to be a public meeting. And uh, ICRC, CMCOG, they said, no, let's do something that's a little more accessible. The other amazing thing about that number is we launched this video three days before Christmas. And within 48 hours, we already had 600 of those 727 uh, views. Um, so again, the thing I learned, and, and Mark was all behind this from the get-go, he said, he goes, you know, People are sitting at grandma's house with nothing to do. He said, they're going to take their phones and they're going to go watch that video. I mean, it's only nine minutes, right? 
So he was dead on, and, and that was a beautiful thing. And so again, great input. We feel like we've got the community behind us. We also did a survey. You saw there over 1,000 people responded to the survey. Again, just a remarkable number. Uh, with the survey, we wanted to get a feel for where folks live, where they go to, go to work or school. You can see the breakdown here. So the folks that took this survey were not just Lexington County folks. Uh, these were throughout the Midlands. Uh, so this is an important project. Uh, both within and, with, and outside of the county. Uh, we also, whoops, let's go back one. I just need to be patient, don't I? Not my strong suit. Uh, we also looked at some other uh, pieces along this. So how are people using the existing facilities that are connected to? And you can see that there's a variety of uses for the facilities, uh, both at the Three Rivers Greenway and Saluda Shoals. And uh, of course, Johnny Jeffcoat uh, walkway people are using it quite a bit, you, you folks know that. And uh, one of the things that this freeway is gonna do, um, it's gonna connect a whole lot more people up to that walkway. And so we're gonna see that exponentially change. And I'm gonna show you a graphic here in a little bit about how we're gonna be looking at that intersection in six and 60, because there's gonna need to be some improvements there for safety. Um, as a bicyclist, how would you describe yourself? This is something we wanted to get a good feel for because people have different comfort levels bicycling. Um, I'm, I'm what falls into uh, the interested but concerned uh, category. So I do this for a living. Uh, most of the work I do involves some kind of bicycle facility, but I like separated paths. I like trails. I like protected facilities. Um, and in fact, I do so. I've done some road biking in the past, um, but that's something I would have never done with my kids. Uh, it's something my wife would never want to go do. Um, so we're, these facilities that we're designing here with the Lower Saluda Greenway are the kind of facilities that are going to draw the most people. And you can see here, um, you got about, say, 20% that just, you know, they're not interested in riding a bike, and that's okay. But you've only got about 15% uh, that say, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, I'm a warrior. And that leaves you with this other 36% that is really looking for this type of a facility to get out on their bicycle. Another key question that we asked folks is we said, we listed a lot of neighborhoods that are in proximity to the Greenway, and we said, if you had safe connections from your neighborhood to the Greenway, would you feel comfortable walking and biking to the Greenway? Because see, that's key, because what we don't want to create is a facility where everybody feels like they have to get in, put the bike on the back of the car, drive there, that type of thing. Um, so you see here 77% of people said if we could have those safe connections, we would, do, we would actually be an active, active user from our home, not just for the time our car gets there. So that was key, and I'll, I'll show you a map here in a little bit where we're, we're looking a little more long term at those connections and where those might should go. So we went through an alternatives evaluation and a conceptual design. Let me see how I'm doing. Oh, okay, I got some time here. Um, Basically what we did was we, uh, this is a little different to a roadway project. So when you think of a roadway project and you think of going through alternatives, you usually have like some very distinct geographies for those alternatives. So you might have, you know, a corridor that runs through the middle. If you recall when, when all the considerations were going on, you know, here in downtown Lexington, um, you know, you had, well, let, do we do one-way pairs? Do we shift it all over here? Do we shift it all down here? Do we build a bypass? You know, all those things are considered. But with a greenway, you don't really have that. Because when you look at alternatives, you know you want to keep it as close to the river as possible. Um, you, we knew we wanted to be uh, that the north side of the river is where we needed to be because those were where we were trying to connect those existing facilities. So your alternatives become what we call kind of key decision points. Along, the corridor isn't gonna change dramatically, but we're gonna hit places where maybe we've got wetlands. And so do we wanna to go to the north of the wetlands, to the south of the wetlands, or through the wetlands? And each of those have different pros and cons. And so what you can see here is every time we hit a decision point, each, each of these letters, and this is just one, one segment of the Greenway, um, we, would, we would say, okay, here at A, we've got three alternatives, and we would weigh them against a series of uh, evaluation criteria. And these criteria went back to the purpose of the project. Uh, so it had to do with, you know, will we be able to acquire right away or get an easement? So that's, you know, what, which one would be easier to do that? Uh, what would the cost be? 
to construct? What's more expensive, less expensive? Uh, what will keep us closest to the river? What will give us better scenic views? Those types of things. So that's how we weighed each of these. And what that brought us to was what we call preferred alignment. And so this is what you can see here is the preferred alignment. Uh, again, these, the green areas are existing uh, bike and pedestrian facilities of, of some type. Um, and then all of the blue is what we would call uh, just kind of a standard uh, trail. Where you see the yellow, those are boardwalks where we believe we're going to be in some kind of area that we need. Uh, it's going to potentially flood at times or it may be going through a wetland area. So we need, need to uh, treat it a little differently. And then all the red points are some type of bridge structure. Now the vast majority of the bridge structures are fairly small. Uh, they'd be stick built. Uh, we do have, I think, one that would be more of a prefab kind of bridge because it's about 110 feet long, that type of thing. But uh, overall, you know, you come up with a general uh, process here. And I'm going to stress this is not design, this is planning. Uh, so we don't have a survey yet. We don't, you know, have a lot of the, the details, but we're doing the best we have with the information that we have. What we did do, though, because we're not doing final design by any means, not even schematic design, we did want to put in some things in the feasibility study that we want to consider when design does occur. We wanted to have kind of some uh, guiding, a guidepost, if you will. And these are the four things that we emphasize in the document. Uh, continuity. So the idea here is that uh, the greenway should be seamless. And that doesn't just mean the sections that are being built now. It means the sections that it's connecting to. Uh, because we want, when someone's out on that greenway, they need to know where they are and where they're going and feel comfortable about that. You never want anybody on a greenway uh, getting somewhere and going, do I go right or do I go left? Or am I, am I still on the greenway? I mean, I think we've all had those hiking experiences where you're, you know, trudging through and you go, uh, is this still the path? You know, so you want to be very clear about where, where you're going. Uh, you want to be coherent. Uh, so this gets more back uh, to the visual um, it's also very links in with that continuity idea. The idea of it being a priority facility is very important. Now, what's nice about the Lower Saluda Greenway is we don't have like dozens and dozens of crossings of streets and things because we are down on the river. Uh, but we do have a few places where we're crossing some rail lines. Uh, we do have uh, one or two streets that we have to cross. And of course, obviously, uh, SC6 is one of those that's not uh, to just say it's a street is probably an understatement. Um, so, uh, but when we do that, we want to make sure that the greenway has priority because the most vulnerable users are going to be on that greenway. Uh, the folks, you know, obviously we are all very uh, attuned to um, if I get in a fight with a car, uh, I'm going to lose, right? Because um, I'm the vulnerable user as a person. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving that priority. And when we can't give physical separation to that priority, we need to give time separation to that. Um, so we're looking at that as well. And, th and that gets into this, this idea of separation, that we do want to provide as much physical separation as possible. Uh, but again, if we can't, we want to make sure that we're looking at how to uh, separate that timing and the, and the speed is being controlled where vehicles are concerned. So uh, we proposed a 12-foot trail, and uh, again, that's wider than most, uh, most trails you see in the Midlands. Uh, again, the reason for that is this is tied back uh, to the funding that we believe we're going to be seeking. Uh, so when you build a trail with more local funds or state funds, uh, you have the ability to go down to whatever size you want to. And I believe most of the trails in the Midlands are about 8 feet. Uh, there may be a few at 10 feet. Um, but the reality is when you seek federal funding, and in particular, if we're going to seek transportation dollars, then what's going to happen is the standard that's going to be used is something known as the AASHTO Guide, which is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And that guide, they have a particular uh, subset guide that is called the AASHTO Bike Guide. And that guide dictates how bike facilities should be designed. And a 12-foot minimum path is what that uh, guide has now, it does allow to go down to eight feet in constrained areas, so certainly if you're trying to get to a wetland or trying to get, get around a piece of property or something like that, you can go down, but the majority of the length 
it needs to be 12 feet. Now, it's quite possible at the end of the day that this could be funded with all local funding, and therefore, maybe a 10-foot or an 8-foot trail could happen. But we wanted to look at it from the standpoint of, if we're going to seek a certain type of funding, we need to design this or think about it the way that that funding would require. Um, so it's almost, you know, trying to give a, a worst-case scenario from a, from a cost perspective. Um, and then if, if it happens another way, then that's great. So um, 12 feet. Now, what I will say is somebody who uh, designs grain raising trails regularly, um, 12 feet is wonderful for a trail. Um, you know, sometimes an eight-foot trail can feel a little, little tight. So there's other reasons to, to have that. Um, but again, you have to balance this with what you can accomplish. And then this is a graphic that will probably be of interest. This is that 6 and 60 intersection. Um, and we did look at a variety of alternatives. So we looked at uh, kind of three key alternatives at this intersection. Um, and they're probably what most of you could guess. Uh, we looked at uh, going at, at grade across the intersection. Uh, we looked at the potential for a pedestrian bridge uh, over the roadway. And then we also uh, looked at a tunnel uh, feature going under. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different things that are constraining us on this. Uh, I do believe you know, that this is something that may get a little more consideration when it really moves into design. Uh, but one of the key things is cost, obviously. Um, a bridge or a tunnel would be exponentially more expensive than an accurate crossing. Um, I'm someone who really believes that accurate crossings can be designed very well. So much of it is in the signalization. Um, and one of the things that we are mentioning uh, that we would like to see investigated is the ability to institute a pedestrian only phase at this signal. Uh, because already, uh, all of you know, there are just hundreds, if not thousands of people each day uh, traveling the Johnny Jeffco walkway on the, on the uh, dam. Um, when this intersection was designed, so this intersection is not that old as far as having been up upgraded. Um, I don't know, it's probably been maybe a decade ago uh, when the dam was widened and, and, and this intersection was improved. There were far fewer people in this area. Um, you know, we know, I mean, there's apartment complexes that have just been built uh, to the north of here just in the last few years. There's housing developments that continue to develop. Um, so already, there are many more people crossing this intersection on foot than anyone would have ever dreamed uh, when the dam was widened. I also don't think even the most optimistic person would have thought it would have been the draw that it is. I mean, it, it's just an amazing draw, uh, getting people out there. Um, now, naturally, if we connect the Greenway in on this corner, and say we are coming in, um, then you're talking even more. Uh, people coming through this intersection. Uh, so we wanted to look at this and say, you know, what, what can be accomplished? And again, keep in mind our study is, is a feasibility study, so we're looking for the most feasible options. Uh, and so we're looking at, in the study, we're looking at an grade crossing. Things that we're looking at, uh, a couple of things here on the northern quadrants of the intersection. Currently you have uh, slip lanes similar to the ones on the south uh, here. Uh, what those slip lanes do, they move traffic, but they keep speeds high. And that, that is a key thing with those. And so one of the biggest things that needs to happen at this intersection is we still want to put cars through it. We don't want to create you know, traffic jams. We need cars to slow down as they're going through it. Um, so one aspect is not removing right turn lane. So the right turn lane is a little hard to see in this graphic, but the right turn lane still exists. But rather than just being able to free flow through these areas, you would come to the stop bar, make a stop, and then make a right on red if you were, if you were gonna do that. Um, on the southern quadrants, uh, because of the volumes that are there, uh, we're gonna leave the slip lanes, but what we're proposing are what we call raised crossings. And these are kind of, you may have heard them called like a speed table. They ramp up, they level off, and then they ramp back down. And essentially, it just causes you to have to slow down a little bit to make that. The other beautiful thing about them is it raises the pedestrian and bicyclists up to a better height so the drivers are seeing them almost eye to eye uh, rather than being down at the street level. Um, and so those are some of the key things. Also some pedestrian uh, refuge islands. And then one of the things that we mentioned here too is that 
when this does go to design, uh, landscaping and gateway treatments. I know that when this was originally designed, that was something that Lexington County really wanted as part of the design, and for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And so that's something that could happen now, is seeing more of a gateway treatment here, because this is one of the premier uh, gateways in, into this area. So then also, I mentioned to you earlier that we're looking at long-term connectivity. Um, this is a map, and again, this is a very 50,000 foot level. Um, but we wanted to look at, if, if you've got this greenway corridor, how do we begin to get the surrounding community to it? And so we looked at a variety of connectivity options there, and uh, I'm sure there's another 30 or 40, you know, that could be put on here. But again, we were trying to say, what are some of the prime, key, uh, most important connections to be looking at first? Um, each of these colors represent kind of a different, uh, what we call bike, bikeway facility. Um, we have uh, this green color that's a neighborhood bikeway. That is more of a speed treatment on neighborhood roadways, so a little bit of traffic calming, some pavement marking, some signage. Um, these are streets that you should be able to ride a bike on comfortably without a lot of separation or, because you should have traffic that's going at 20, 25 miles per hour. Um, and so by, by having those speed treatments, and you see there's just a few of those, uh, we also have a little bit of what we call shared lane, and that's mostly running through uh, park areas that are already, they're already recreation areas where, again, they're not really primary streets. They're more connectivity within park areas. Uh, we do have a lot of shared use, use path. You see that, uh, all the blue color here. And again, that would be a separated path off to the side of the roadway, so it would uh, have a little bit of a, a vegetated buffer between the curb and the bikeway itself. And then uh, we do have one bicycle and pedestrian bridge that we show right here. Um, and that is something that the town of Lexington is, is exploring uh, in, very, in the very early stages right now, is having some connectivity across the river, uh, which would be really, really great. So with that, uh, that's what I uh, have for you today. I am more than happy to, uh, and I'll say attempt to answer questions. Um, but uh, just again, thank you for allowing me to be here today.